Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Valley View. We're so excited you're here. Would you please stand and worship with us? Father God, that good things come to us, Lord. 
We praise you, Father God. We give you the glory. We just ask that you be with us, Lord. Protect us in the months to come, Father God. And we're looking forward towards 2021, Lord, where we see your miracles fall down over us.
All right, so this next song is a brand new one. Um, you might have heard it on the radio. It's a Hillsong United song, and our youth group kids definitely know this because the youth band plays this, so definitely sing along. For those that don't know it, you can sing along with us if you want to close your eyes and just listen to the words. The words are unbelievably powerful, especially with everything that's been going on in 2020. Um, this whole song is kind of an ode to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and God being in the fire with them through everything. And I know so much is going on in this country right now and in this world. It's just like pure madness, it feels like, from day to day. But God is with us. He is with you in whatever trial you are going through right now. He has not left you. He is literally right next to you. And he's right next to you right now, too. So feel free to just listen or feel free to sing along. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire. So come what 
like me in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. There'll be another ring of fire standing next to me. There'll be another ring of waters holding back the seas. Should I Good morning. Welcome to Valley View Chapel. I'm Pastor Andrew Brackman, uh, the associate pastor here, and we're just we're grateful that you're here. Uh, we're grateful that you're joining us online. If you're on Facebook tuning in today, maybe you'll tune in next week. And so we say welcome to you. Thank you for coming. Today we've got several things that interest you, interest all of us. Of course, what a, what a week in our nation of uh, tumult and indecision and uncertainty. And so uh, we're, we're being people of prayer, right? Lifting up every need that we know to, to go to our God in confidence, knowing that he's in control, that he's loving, that he's faithful, that he's not uncertain, that he's not unsteady. And so um, we lift those things up. In fact, would you, would you pray now with me? about many of these things. Father, we turn to you. Our eyes are on you. We confess our deep need, our need for you to provide all that we, uh, that we do need, that we know or don't know yet, our need to be loved by one who gives it unconditionally, our need to receive mercy, to receive grace. And Lord, we also come to you with our need for your power in our lives, to bring change into our lives and to help us to lead others into change as well through your Holy Spirit. Let us do that as we stand on your word, the truth of your word, and move in your love, the love of Christ. So Lord, we do lift up our country. We lift up our neighbors, our town. We're surrounded by needs that you know and, and a lot that we don't. So, Lord, give us eyes to see what we can do, the words that we can say, the gestures of love that we can extend. Show us how to be your people that act and move like Jesus and go to the ones that Jesus is pursuing. So, Lord, we bring these things to you, confident that you hear, confident that you respond. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to remind you, um, while you're here in the building anyway, uh, please do wear masks uh, and so observe that and be, um, be courteous to others for that. Um, also, today is the last day to complete your, your annual, annual membership, or sorry, annual report uh, nominations uh, for, for those elected officials who serve as deaconesses, trustees, deacons, elders. Uh, there's there's um, forms in the hallway. You can complete those nominations and submit those today as the last day. Got a couple things that we want to make you aware of. Next week is our last day of collection for Operation Christmas Child boxes. You can pick up those in the foyer, simply fill them with toys. There's directions on what to do for that, but bring those back next Sunday. We'll, uh, we'll send them off the week after that. Uh, we're grateful that some of you took those, but please bring them back. It's, uh, it's great that you took them. Bring them on back, uh, filled up. And, and make sure also to, to fill out, um, to pay for the shipping and stuff like that. Uh, last year we had some issues with that, so please pay for the shipping and the, the cost of the handling of the box. In one week, on Saturday, we'll have two events. One is here, uh, and then one is virtual for uh, involving our whole district. 
but uh, we'll hear a little bit more about those things. But we're going to run a couple videos back to back. First, to show you what Operation Christmas Child, the kind of impact it has, because we're a church that's looking for impact here and around the world. And Operation Christmas Child is a way to see that done around the world. And then we'll also see how we can engage with missions, with international work through the Christian Missionary Alliance um, around the world next weekend with a, an event called Global Impact. So check out these couple videos, and then you'll hear from any IMAT who is our missions chairperson. We're here in the middle of Puerto Santa Ana in Ecuador, close to the Amazon. Kids are receiving the shoebox for the very first time in their lives. Gracias por empacar las cajitas de regalo. Gracias por orar por estos niños. When I was 10 years old, I received an Operation Christmas Child shoebox in my hometown, Ambato, Ecuador. I remember my favorite thing in that box it was like this black jacket, super cool, that I was wearing until I turned 16, I think. <laughs> I understand when I received the shoebox that God was taking care of me in a particular way. He was putting his eyes on me. When I understood that, I just felt that I needed to give something back. So after I, I received my shoebox, I, I decided that I want to do something, but I was not a, a, a preacher back those days. I was Stan. <laughs> so the, the easy way was become a clown. <laughs> so I was a clown. I used to do a lot of puppets and those kind of stuff, uh, trying to just turn the gospel with the shoeboxes and all those things. When you understand that God could call anyone, but he decided to call you, <laughs> it makes me feel like I need to do my greatest and just put all my energy as the people that were part of the party that I was in when I was 10. I want to be the same thing now. <laughs> I want to give my all my energy because you never know who around all of those children are becoming pastors, are becoming servants. We're not just giving gifts to the children. We are opening doors for them to understand that God has an entire life for them. God has a plan with every single children that is receiving this shoebox. Today, I have the privilege to be the senior pastor in the Echos Pentimeve Church in Ambato, Ecuador. This simple shoe box gave me the chance to see my great father loves for me. And now that's the reason that all Sunday mornings, I'm so excited to, to go to the church and share the gospel and, and, and preach. It gave me the chance to see that there are many people just like me that are in need, maybe just of a hack or just to hurt them, Jesus loved them. And now I'm able to do that because someone just heard God's voice and put a black jacket on my shoebox. Man, it's just so crazy that people are just so willing to give something from themselves. But that is God. It's God working through people for other people. And for the ones that are packing shoeboxes, man, thank you very much. You are doing a huge, huge work just hearing God's voice. So as you pack those boxes, As we, as we watch that first video, um, as you pack the, the boxes for Operation Christmas Child, 
I challenge you to take a minute, maybe while you're standing there in Walmart or Target or the dollar store, wherever you might be, and say, okay, Lord, what, what unique item do you want me to put in this box? Um, I wonder if they're going to get like 10,000 black jackets <laughs> in boxes. <laughs> but, but really, um, yeah, the Lord moves through that. So, so just ask the Holy Spirit, all right, Lord, you know, what can I put in this box for this kid that I don't know yet, uh, but you do? Um, anyway, so missions uh, is going on all around the world where people on mission sent out to live out the love of Jesus and to preach his message in word and deed. Um, any I met is our mission chairperson. So any come on up and share with us some opportunities that we have. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Let's try that again. How are we doing? Awesome. <laughs> Um, as Pastor Andrew said, I have been asked to chair our missions committee for the following year. And as you saw in the second video, uh, the theme for the 2021 uh, missions campaign is unfinished. Now, how many of you procrastinate? I should be seeing all hands up. Everybody's hands should be up. Okay, that's human of us. We go and we don't do what we intend to do, or we think about it too much and then we never get there. Unfinished means that God has a mission for us. He has asked us to go out there and let everybody know about Jesus. And it won't be done until everybody has heard about him. So if your heart is being touched by this idea, we actually have a lot of room on our missions committee. We are, our goal for this year, for this coming year, is that we want to uh, fund an international worker because there's a lot of areas that definitely need it where the word of Jesus needs to be spread out. So if you find it in your heart that you would like to work with our commissions committee, feel free to speak to me. Um, the other thing also is that we have an upcoming uh, CMA event next Saturday. Just to let you know, it is gonna be and rightfully so, it's gonna be in conflict with the other seminar that we have on conflict resolution. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we, we couldn't have planned this any better. So, um, so, our Metro District has sponsored a virtual event called Global Impact. So that will allow us to actually meet and speak with, virtually, the international workers that are out there that the, that the CMA is now supporting so if you are interested in that, we have posted the connection to it in the VIEW newsletter this past Wednesday. We will do it again next Wednesday. If you don't get the newsletter or if you want to find out more information, speak to me. I can connect you and put it in an email and give you the link for that as well. So if you're not going to the conflict resolution seminar, you're more than welcome to go and join that. That's next Saturday, November the 14th. And staying on the missions theme, we have today Michelle Davis, she is the site coordinator for Envision New York City. Uh, unfortunately, we were planning to go there this past summer, but we had a little nasty thing called COVID who opted not to do that. But that's still an open uh, invitation to do it next year. So I want to introduce to you Michelle Davis of Envision New York City. Good morning. Unfinished stories, that's our theme today. So let's take a, just a brief moment to look at the word unfinished. It starts with the prefix un and obviously ends with the word finished. So let's think about um, what God has finished. What are the things that he talks about in scripture that he has finished? Looking at Genesis 2, starting with verse one, we read, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. And on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because he rested from all the work of creating. 
Here we see the work of God in creating the world. It was a finished task. God started the story with creating the heavens and the earth out of nothing. And he ended the story on the seventh day with rest. God models a pattern for us of work and rest in this finished work of creation. And in John 19.30, Jesus on the cross declares, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What is it that was finished? What was Jesus referring to? Redemption. Reconciliation of humanity with God. Jesus, our, har our high priest, paid the only acceptable sacrifice. We don't need to walk in our own strength or in our own righteousness because the finished work of the cross, because of the finished work of the cross, we don't have to do it on our own. That work is finished in our unfinished story. That is amazing news. Whenever we try to live our lives in our own strength, our own capacity, our own effort, it's as if we're saying to God that his work on the cross wasn't finished, when in fact, it is finished. It's saying his work didn't quite cover all of us when we try to do things in our own strength. Let's decide to build our lives on the foundation of the finished work of Christ. So now let's shift a little bit to the word unfinished. The Oxford Dictionary defines unfinished as incomplete, not concluded. Synonyms might be half done, undeveloped, immature, unpolished, partial. Something in the word unfinished for me suggests that the task has been started. It's not something that's never been started, it's been started and it's somewhere along its completion. It may be in the beginning, it may be in the middle, it may be right toward the end, but it's not yet finished. It's like a piece of artwork with some brush strokes on the canvas and the ideas in the artist's head, unfinished. Like a woodworking piece, woodworking project that's partially finished. Or a puzzle. I don't know if any of you did puzzles during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, our family did a bunch, but it's it's, you know, finding that last puzzle piece that makes it unfinished. What about 2020? An unprecedented year. It's still unfinished. And unfortunately, the pandemic is also unfinished. But you know what else is unfinished? God's mission. It's an unfinished mission. In Matthew 28, Jesus commissions his disciples, and by extension, us, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything he commanded them. Earlier in Matthew 24, 14, Jesus declares that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony, and then the end will come. It hasn't yet come. It's unfinished. It's an unfinished mission with lots of unfinished stories in our lives, in our community, and all over the world. This morning, we're going to spend just a little bit of time in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. In Luke 4.18 and following, Jesus tells the people in the synagogue in Nazareth his mission, referring from Isaiah 61, 1-2. Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then the full passage continues in Isaiah, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. And they will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Just looking around our communities, 
and our world, it is not hard to see the unfinished work, the unfinished mission of God. There are ancient ruins to be restored. There are ruined cities to be renewed. There are people all over the world who need their ashes exchanged for a crown of beauty and mourning to re be replaced with oil of gladness, praise to flow from their mouths instead of despair, sight for the blind, freedom for prisoners, both literally freedom for prisoners, the changing of people's lives who are in prison so they can be free, and figuratively breaking the prison that we put ourselves in, the lies that we believe, the betrayal, the hopelessness, a releasing of oppression, so many people all over our world need to be released from oppression. And the best news is, that's what Jesus came for and what we're privileged to be a part of. Consider that today, over 4,000 people groups representing 40% of the world's population have little or no chance to hear the message of Jesus. There are 3.4 billion unreached people all over the world. And these are unprecedented times in more than just the pandemic. God is moving people from all over the world to bring his kingdom. More people are on the move than ever in history. 245 million people live outside their country of origin. That's one in 29 people. So in a group like this, that would be a whole handful of people. Some of those people, God is moving here to Long Valley and the surrounding areas. So we have unprecedented times and unprecedented opportunities. As we join God in his unfinished mission, let's look at the model of Jesus, as I said in the beginning of Luke. After all, Jesus tells us to model his life after us. It's all throughout the New Testament that he's our pattern, he's our high priest, he can... Um, relate to our sufferings because of his suffering. One of the passages that struck me as I was um, preparing for this is in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. And out of the message, a paraphrased translation from the biblical text, it reads, Jesus says, are you worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me. And that's the part of the passage that I usually focus on. Yes, I want rest, Lord. I wanna learn how to rest, and that is important. But it goes on to say, I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay ev anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Look, let's look at the beginning of Luke to see two of these unforced rhythms of grace that Jesus embodied. First thing that I notice in the beginning of Luke and throughout all the Gospels, in fact, is that Jesus was not in a hurry. I don't know if that's ever struck you, but he was fully present to the people that were around him, even though there were lots of people, even in his time with the, the smaller population that didn't know Jesus, he wasn't in a hurry. He was just present with whoever was right in front of him. He lived a simple very simple life, focusing just on what the Father had called him to do, just doing the Father's will, even in the midst of conflict. So in Luke 4, right after the people are stirred up because Jesus has read Isaiah 61 and he sits down in the temple and says, this is fulfilled today in your presence, and they are not happy with him. They are furious. They want to throw him off a cliff. They want to run him out of town. I would probably be hightailing it out of there. But he just walks out of town. He just walks right out of town and eludes them. And Luke 8, Jairus' daughter, you all are familiar with this story, comes and pleads for Jesus to come and see his daughter who's dying. Clearly a time-sensitive issue. A medical emergency. And how does Jesus respond? Well, he starts to go. And then he's surrounded by a crowd and he stops to talk with a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. He stops to be present with the one who's right in front of him. 
even though as a, a nurse myself by training, it doesn't really seem like the best triaging decision. She had been bleeding for 12 years and this other child is actually dying. In fact, it did not seem like the best situation probably to Jairus either because she in fact died. But we know the end of the story. When he arrived, he raised her from the dead, but not before stopping to talk and with and heal the woman, a woman who was oppressed, who was ostracized, who was grieving, and he gave her a crown of beauty and the oil of gladness to replace her mourning. So she could become an oak of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. Jesus also was constantly interrupted, and yet, did he ever appear to be in a hurry? Consider in Luke 5, where we see that he's in the middle of teaching. He's in somebody's home, he's in the middle of teaching, and all of a sudden people lower a man through the roof. Like that would be as if somebody just came through the roof right now with an announcement of sorts or with a, a request. Jesus stops what he's doing and he heal, first he forgives the man's sins and then he heals the man. In Luke 7, the pattern continues. Jesus is walking into the town of Nan with his disciples and a large crowd. As he's walking into town, he sees a dead person being carried out. The only son of a mother who was a widow herself. Jesus' story intersects with this woman's story. Her story is one of grieving, of losing both her only son and her husband. Jesus stops walking and is present to this woman, raising her son from the dead and changing her despair into a garment of praise. I am stretched by the example of Jesus in living an unhurried life. I don't know about you. Honestly, I'm often in a hurry. I sometimes even run around my small Manhattan apartment because I'm in such a hurry. Even in the midst of writing this section, quite literally, my 10-year-old son came to me and asked if he could do something, and my response was, yes, but hurry. And as soon as the words came out of my mouth, I thought, why does he have to hurry? Why? What is the hurry? Two more minutes of sleep? I don't know that that's worth the stress that I was creating in the environment by hurrying him along. Dallas Willard comments that hurry is the greatest enemy of our spiritual life, of the spiritual life in our day. And um, he says you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry in your life. John Mark Comer, um, in a book that I highly recommend called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, talks about how hurry and love do not mix. They're like oil and water. And that's exactly what I was doing to my son. I was not being loving. I was doing the hurry thing. To walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry, as Father Walter Adams says, is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. How often am I overlooking what God is doing because I'm just simply too rushed to notice? Because Jesus wasn't in a hurry, he was able to give his full attention to whoever was right in front of him. He was present and he was attuned to what God was doing. David Benner says that earth's crammed, earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush is a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest around, sit around and pluck blackberries. How much do we miss of the unfinished stories of other people's lives simply because we're in too much of a hurry? On Friday, I dropped my two younger kids off at school and decided to walk home which normally I don't do, but it, it was it's 47 blocks, so it's a fairly long walk. I just, I love New York City. God's given me a deep love for the city and for the people there. And there's just, there's such diversity. I heard so many different languages as I walked home and observed so many different cultures. I asked God to bring healing to the city as I walked. 
that has faced so much loss from the pandemic and the economic repercussions of the pandemic. I walked past a city MD, still with people lined around the block waiting to get in. At one point, I heard a lady speaking in Wolof. She was just right behind me. It was kind of a quiet block. It was probably just me and her on the block. I heard her speaking in Wolof. That's the language of people from Senegal, where my husband and I served for almost 10 years. I slowed my pace because I was, I was curious. I wanted to, to, I was hoping her phone conversation would be brief and I could ask her where in Senegal she was from and how long she'd lived in America. I overheard her mention something about a family member who was sick. We were still walking in the same direction for several blocks, so we walked on the opposite ends of the block, I guess, but in the same direction. I was just anticipating her getting off the phone so I could engage her in conversation. I was even saying, God, you just put her right here for me to be able to talk with her on my way home. Disappointed, at one point, she turned to walk in another direction, and I was disappointed. But I did think it would be a little odd if I started to follow her, so I decided not to do that. But I was disappointed, and I wondered why God had allowed her to cross my path if not to talk with her. Immediately, I sensed God telling me to pray for her, that that's why he had put her in my path, to pray for her sick family member, who I couldn't discern any of the details in the conversation that she was talking about. That was my part of her unfinished story, was to contend in prayer. So many people would say that for a person, a Muslim person to come to Christ, it often takes 14 encounters. And we never know where we are in the encounters. And, and that's just a, some estimates that sometimes it doesn't, it takes one, sometimes it takes 25 or more. But maybe I was her encounter number one, or maybe she was already a believer, I don't know. But God called me to contend. And as soon as I started to pray for her, as I was still processing my disappointment with not being able to talk with her, I saw out of the corner of my eye a deli. I, I had never really walked in this part of town before. And the name of the deli was called Olive Branch. And I was reminded of the, the symbolism in scripture of peace and of reconciliation. And I prayed for her. And um, I don't even know her name, but God does. And I continued walking, and I looked up and I saw inscribed into an old building, I think it's actually a, maybe a Jewish seminary even, at the top of the building was inscribed, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And I was reminded of God's presence, that God is all around, he's always moving. God reminded me that my story intersected with her unfinished story for just that moment, even though I never got to talk with her. God was speaking to me, telling me that he was at work and that I needed to slow down and enter in. A few weeks ago, Aisha came hobbling to the park as we were gathering with more than a dozen West African ladies who participate in our ESL classes. We had been doing in-person ESL classes before the pandemic, but we had stopped doing that. And then we were hoping, and we have in fact launched some online classes. But trying to explain Zoom online over the phone to somebody whose language is um, not English and who's struggling to learn English is very difficult. So we figured, let's just bring them together in a park, masks on, socially distant, and we can try to go over Zoom with these ladies. So we practiced it, showed them on their phone how to mute, unmute, you know, breakout rooms, sort of. And um, as we finished up, Aisha lingered after most of the other ladies left. Honestly, I was ready to go home. It had been a long afternoon with the ladies, and I had even arrived late to the gathering because I had been in the ER with my 10-year-old son who had cut his finger and needed several layers of stitches, and, and I was tired. In fact, I was exhausted, and I just thought, God, I, I, I did the gathering. I'm ready to go home, but Aisha wanted to talk. She told us about her swollen knees, her really painful knees. In fact, she showed us. She pulled up her long skirt all the way down to her ankles. She, we had a chair there. She sat out and she pulled up her skirt and showed us her swollen knees. They both were quite swollen. And um, we asked if we could pray for her in Jesus' name, my uh, two ministry partners and I. And so we prayed for her. 
We prayed that God would miraculously move in her knees, that God would touch her, that she would sense God's nearness. And as we finished praying, an even more complicated story came tumbling out about a son in Europe who hadn't received payment for work for nine months. He'd been working as a in manual labor, and the person had not paid him. And he had um, turned to drinking because he was so depressed and didn't have money to pay his bills. And to her two teenage daughters, who she desperately wants to bring to the U.S., who were in very unsafe conditions in her home, in, in her family's home in West Africa. And when I say unsafe, I mean very unsafe, these girls. And she was desperate to have God move so that, so that they could come and be out of that situation and she could be reunited with them. And so again, we prayed. We prayed for God to miraculously intervene and to show his power and his justice in Aisha's life. The very next morning, Aisha called our ministry partner to joyfully report the complete healing in her knees. God had healed her knees completely. Praise God. And what's more is that she then told several of her Muslim friends, herself, she herself is a Muslim, told several of her Muslim friends, God healed my knees. Those, those Christians, they prayed for me last night, and my knees are healed. And so other people started to say, well, maybe we should ask for prayer too, if God moves in that way. So we're praying that she senses the love and the tenderness of the Father in drawing her to himself. After numerous calls and appointments, our ministry partner was able to go with Aisha to a pro bono lawyer, which is not that easy to find. It's even more difficult to find in the middle of a pandemic. So she could complete the next necessary pa paperwork she had till September 30th to get a certain form filed to see if maybe she could get approval to bring her, her two daughters to the States. And so one of our partners was able to go with her and the lawyer said yes, and they submitted the form and they even got received that the form was submitted and now she waits seven to nine months to hear if her request will be approved. So join us in praying that the work that God started in miraculously healing her knees, that he would continue in miraculously bringing her daughters to the U.S. And just last week, though, the miracles continue in her life. Her son found a new job where he's getting regularly paid, and he has stopped drinking. Aisha's story is unfinished, and I count it a privilege that my unfinished story intersected with hers. When I wanted to just go home, I was finished. But God said, no, I want you to be present for the one who's right in front of you. I don't want you to be in a hurry to rush home. I want you to be present. I want to simplify my life around what really matters to eliminate hurry in my life so I can be fully present to all of those who are in front of me, even to my 10-year-old son who had a question for me, and I hurried him along. When we live unhurried lives, we have eyes to see things and people who we have never seen before. To see the brokenhearted, to see the captives and the prisoners and those who mourn. And we will be privileged to see beauty come from ashes and garments of praise to come from despair, just like Jesus did. We will allow our fun, unfinished stories in our own lives to interweave with un with other people's unfinished stories. Who in your community might be overlooked? Who have you overlooked? Who are the brokenhearted? Who are those who are mourning? Who are those who are in prison, either literally or figuratively? What ancient ruins can you rebuild? What are the injustices in your community that need to be rebuilt? Taken down and rebuilt. The second thing that I would like to consider briefly is Jesus' practice of solitude. Jesus regularly pulled away from all activities with people to spend time with his Father. We see in Luke 4 that right after his baptism, right after he hasn't even done any ministry, he had been baptized, and he doesn't do anything except full of the Holy Spirit, he goes out to the wilderness for 40 days alone with God. That's more than a month alone with God. 
I've never spent 40 days alone with God, it would probably be amazing and transformative. Later in Luke 4, after an evening in Stephen's home healing people till I don't know how late, at daybreak he wakes up to go out to a solitary place. In Luke 5, we read that as the news spread about him and crowds came to be healed by him, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Several theologians have remarked that the busier his schedule became, the more he removed himself to lonely places. That's not really true of my life, to tell you the truth. The busier I become, the smaller my spaces of solitude with the Lord become. Not Jesus. Like Jesus, in times of solitude with the Father, we can cement our identity. We see in John 15 and all throughout Scripture that the Father prunes. He takes away things. He removes things out of our life, and he prunes the things that are in our life to make us more fruitful. It's in these times of intimacy with the Father that he does this deep work in our lives. Of course, community is important. There are, there are lots of things that are important, but this is one thing that God does individually and intimately in our lives. We gain perspective and priorities. As part of my time, time with the Lord in the mornings. I spend time in solitude just being present with the Lord. And I usually, um, usually sometimes 15 minutes, just sit in silence, sometimes longer. And I usually write down my reflections of what I hear the Lord saying to me after that time. Sometimes I hear words of affirmation. Not, it's never of what I've done. It's never like, yeah, that was, that was great. I'm really glad you stuck with it in that ministry moment. No, it's affirmations of, you're mine, you're my child, I love you, I died for you, I'm singing over you. Sometimes I hear difficult words, I hear challenges. You need to correct that. That, that word was harsh, go and repent. Sometimes I see, I've been thinking about symptoms in my own life and other people's lives, I symptoms and the Lord reveals roots. Sometimes I see how he's putting other people in my lives. I see, I see, I think about people. The Lord reminds me of people who I haven't thought of in decades. He brings them to mind and he tells me to go after them, pray for them. But time with the Lord is not just for our own personal spiritual development, as important as that is. It's also time to contend in prayer. It's in these moments with God that he gives us prayer assignments. He gives us prayer burdens. We can partner with God and bring his kingdom. When he was out for 40 days in the wilderness, I imagine that God, that Jesus learned not just about his relationship with his father and grew in intimacy, but that he learned a lot about what the Lord was calling him into. He was praying for the ministry that he was going to step into. He was bringing the kingdom even in those times of solitude. My Nana, um, I don't know if I shared this last year, so if I did, I think it's a great story if I share it again, but my, my Nana, who's now 93 years old, we were cleaning up her house a few years ago and she was moving with my grandfather to an assisted living place and she, she um, just casually turned around and, and handed me a stack of um, a book about Tibet and a few Alliance Life magazines from the 60s and 70s and a long time ago. And she said to me, um, maybe you could help me with this. My son was with us as well, helping to pack up their house. And ma maybe the two of you could help me with this. You see, when I was 13 years old, I can't tell the story without crying, sorry. But when I was 13 years old, the Lord told me to pray for Tibet. And she, she just prayed for Tibet for her entire life and never shared it with anybody. She just contended in prayer for Tibet. And I counted it a privilege to tearfully say to her, Nana, I never knew that, but God is breaking ground there. And I know that because I know stories that God is doing. And you contended for those people who now are coming to know you. And you know what? In those secret places alone with the Lord, she contended for the people of Tibet. And there may be people who the Lord is saying, I want you to contend for because in decades or in future generations, people are going to come to know you. 
And I don't know, uh, there's a passage in Hebrews um, that is challenging to me that talks about the Lord giving. It's at the end of Hebrews where, at the beginning of Hebrews, you see that God gave this promise and you see it come true. God gave this other promise and you see it come true. God gave this and you see it come true. And then you see there are those who contended for the promises and they did never saw it in their lifetime. But you know what? They were contending for the next generation. Are we willing to be people who will contend for the next generation and the next and the next for what God is doing? Back to the topic of, of Tibet. If you want to be a part of what God is doing, you can pray for sure for Tibet, but also send your youth to culture camp this summer. That's one of the unreached people groups that we want to break ground in in New York City. And so that's another way of extending what God is doing and other, other unreached people groups as well. So what if you could be part of someone's unfinished story or part of a whole unreached people group's unfinished story? What if God is calling you to contend for an unreached people group that you may never get to see, you may never get to know much about? They may be far, far away or they may be near. Would you do it? Would it be worth it? Would it be worth the sacrifice in prayer? I had a, an image actually as I was preparing this of, of you and of people with assignments, of prayer assignments, of things to contend for in the kingdom that would come to pass. Maybe tomorrow, maybe in a month, maybe in decades, maybe in many, many decades. So I want to share with you just a few more unfinished stories that you can be a part of that I'm inviting you to join with. There are two young, young Arabic women working um, with our coworker of ours in the Arabic-speaking community. And they are from a very restricted country in the Middle East. They came to Christ against all odds. And here they are in New York City, alone, separated from family, learning English, working jobs, gaining minimum wage, but growing in Christ's likeness and contending for their family to come to Christ. Would you pray for them? Would you pray that more people in their family, that God would start a revival in that country? It would be amazing and a God thing for sure, but that's the God we serve. Contend for two West African men who Brian is meeting with one-on-one, -on -one, so he meets with one of them on Mondays and one of them on Thursdays, and he is doing an alpha-like program for Muslims. So it's like Alpha, you watch the video, they have a meal together, it's just one-on-one, -on -one. it's not, it could be done in a small group, but these are the two men that God has led Brian to. And each week they're seeing the symbolism, they're seeing the prophets, and they're pointing to Christ. Pray for their hearts to be soft, pray for them to understand the truth and the love of Christ. For our ESL women, there are 50 to 60 women and many of them are facing tremendous obstacles. I've already mentioned Aisha, but there are others who need their working papers renewed. They can't work. Their working papers that are outdated, and because of COVID, everything is taking forever in New York City, and so they just, they, they need a miracle. They need their working papers renewed so they can work and provide for their families. For some of them, they're separated from their children and have been for four or five years. Imagine the grief of that, and they're trying to bring them to the U.S., Many of them are in that situation. Some of them are facing joblessness or they're in abusive marriages. One lady in our, in our group um, lost her husband to COVID. These are difficult days for her. Many others, um, we want to pray for protection as they go to work. They're working as home health care workers. They're essential workers and they continue to work in difficult circumstances. Pray for our new site associate, Andrea Eng, who is raising support to come on and join us in Envision New York City. She's an artist and has a burden to use art to bring healing and hope, bring the healing and hope of the gospel. Pray for her as she raises her support. Pray for remote learning. I don't know about it in your community, but it is really hard in the West African community. The moms have no idea when their child is supposed to be on the line. 
and the kids can't figure out, it, it's really complicated. And it's really easy for the teenager to say, like, I'm on class today. And if you don't speak English and you can't read the schedule, you have no idea if your teenager has class. We get calls every week. Should she be on? I don't know if she should be on. I don't know anything about your child's schedule. Or, or she can't get in because she's in 10th grade and they moved her to the 9th grade class. And she, I mean, these are things that we can't really solve over the telephone. So pray for, pray for learning to happen. Pray for hearts to be softened even in this crazy, crazy year. And for relationships with teenage moms, particularly, and their daughters and their sons. It is hard to be in second, a second generation West African kid or Arabic speaking kid. They go to school and their life feels very different than the life at home. And their families want them to follow Muslim traditional values. And the school system is not that. And they're in conflict. Pray for hearts to be softened between moms, particularly, and teenage daughters. We have a handful of moms who every week just call and say, I don't know what to do with my daughter. And there are millions of unfinished stories all over the world that God may be calling you to be a part of. The journey of Jesus on earth ends with death and then resurrection, of course. Death is always followed by resurrection, but the death comes first, and we're called to die. We're called to surrender and to sacrifice as we partner with God in this unfinished mission. It is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice to slow down. It's a sacrifice to contend in prayer. There are many, many other ways that we can sacrifice, but it is well worth the sacrifice to see our unfinished stories interweave with other people's unfinished stories. And you know what? We know the end of the story. There's a lot of unfinished stories, but we know the end of the story. In Revelation 7, 9, it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. No one. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. Let's join our unfinished stories with the unfinished stories happening all over the world for the glory of the King and his kingdom. Thank you. Would you stand and worship with us? spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me for I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind 